Peter will try to answer them during the panel. And now I'm pleased to hand over to Roland to get underway with the panel. Good morning, uh, uh, everybody. I am uh, Roland Montagne, Principal Analyst, Broadband and Aptetics uh, at IDAT World. It's a true pleasure for me uh, to moderate this panel today with the subject on supercharging your fiber network uh, with emerging uh, technology. Uh, before giving the mic uh, to my distinguished panelists, uh, I would like to in introduce the, the, the subject. Uh, we, we know that um, to, today the, 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 the subject of uh, next generation PON is on the table uh, because there is a, a, a quite a surge in terms of consumptions, in terms of bandwidth. We know that uh, COVID-19 crisis has driven up bandwidth demand uh, in homes in nearly all the countries uh, uh, worldwide because of this lockdown. Um, at IDAT, we have reviewed our forecast for 2020 and 2021 in terms of FTTH subscribers in uh, EU uh, 27 plus UK. A and before uh, and after uh, COVID crisis, we have seen in 2020 a surge of growth of 9.5%. Uh, and in 21, this surge will reach more than 10.5% of growth. We know that uh, adoption of teleworking is uh, accelerating worldwide. So this means uh, networks to be robust uh, and connection to be robust to the home with, of course, uh, uh, FTTH that must be built uh, for country uh, resilient uh, uh, economy. Um, I am pleased here uh, to have a, a panel of, of four distinguished speakers with Mr. Oliver Lampater. Oliver is a wireline access expert at Swisscom. We have Mr. Rajesh Yadav, Associate Fellow at Verizon. Mr. Trevor Linné, Research Director at OpenReach. And Mr. Kumar Sivarajan, CTO of Tejas Network. So please, uh, could you introduce yourself in, in a few minutes, uh, starting maybe uh, uh, with Oliver. Hello, everybody. Yeah, my name is Oliver Lamparter. Since uh, more than 10 years, I work for Swisscom. Swisscom is the incumbent operator in, in Switzerland, and we are still the, the leader in wireline and wireless networks. So we uh, have a different uh, to uh, topology with uh, mountains, and then we have uh, uh, the, the more densely populated areas uh, where it's more flat which is a challenge to, to build out uh, broadband throughout the country. So I was involved since more than 10 years in the wireline access. So I was involved in the introduction of VDSL, VDSL2 vectoring, G.fast. And since two years, I'm working in the network department and was there leading the introduction of XGS phone in our network. So in 2019, we, we started with, with XGS phone. Maybe to, to mention, we came not from GPON world, but we had before XGSPON, we already had one third of Switzerland covered with FTTH, but with point to point uh, Ethernet. So this was a, a bit of a challenge to, to migrate from point to point network to, to XGSPON. Actually, the, the migration is, is still ongoing. So we run two parallel networks and uh, all the, the new buildings. And if customers move, they will be switched. Uh, uh, on Twix, she spawned from the beginning. Uh, and also all the customers who wish to have more than one gigabit services, we will also put onto XGS Pond. We also offer our network to our wholesale partners. That means we also have quite a number of different ONTs from the different, uh, let's say, ISPs that also use our network. So we are quite open in which uh, uh, ONTs we allow on our network. The, the main, uh, Restriction is that they need to pass a BBF certification that they are allowed to join our testing. And if that is successful, then they are allowed to use their own ONT. Yes, I think that's for my introduction. Thank you, Oliver. Uh, Rajesh, could you introduce yourself, please? Hello there, I'm uh, Rajesh Yadav. Uh, I'm from uh, Verizon, who's, uh, which is a uh, Big carrier, wireline wireless carrier in uh, United States of America. Um, we've been working on the upon uh, kind of the 
FTTP word for a long time, uh, started deploying Beepon back in 2003, and then we probably were the only carrier who actually deployed Beepon technology uh, and moved on to Gpon uh, starting in 2007 timeframe. Uh, and now we're working towards kind of the next generation of Pond technology. Uh, my focus is primarily on the kind of the wireline access network and evolutions uh, uh, for that network. Uh, so currently we are working on kind of our next gen pawn technology evolution uh, and started to deploy that to support various kind of business residential uh, as well as some of the 5g deployment uh, we are planning to do uh, uh, to support and scale that thank you um, rajesh trevor could you introduce yourself Hi, so yes, um, my, my name is Trevor Linney and as Roland mentioned, I'm uh, OpenReach's uh, research director. <clears throat> so OpenReach is the independent part of BT Group, responsible for building full fiber in the UK. Um, and as we announced just on, under a month ago, we've passed around four and a half million homes or premises in the UK and we're building past sort of around 40,000 premises a week. So that number is already uh, out of date. Um, and we have also recently committed to uh, build like fury to pass 20 million homes um, and premises by sort of mid to late 2020s. Um, as part of that, my responsibility is to be looking up to 10 years out to help OpenReach chart their, um, <coughs> excuse me, technology roadmap to really enable the balance of capacity, performance, energy, future proofing and cost. So that spans from working on interop for current PON systems through to working with universities on the technology required for 100 gigabits per second PON all the way through to new physics to see if there's something beyond single mode fiber we might be talking about in decades to come. Uh, we also study a whole bunch of new tools and techniques for running and building the fiber network and including civil engineering and digital twins and automation to make building that network the best we can uh, for, for decades to come. Thank you. Thank you, Trevor. Uh, Kumar, could you introduce yourself? Thank you, Roland. So I am Kumar Shivarajan. I am the CTO at uh, Tejas Networks. So Tejas Networks is an optical networking uh, vendor uh, based in India. We were doing only optical transport for many years, but over the last five years, we've added you know, broadband. Uh, we started with building some of the largest public uh, broadband networks in India on GPON. The first one connects um, you know, 100,000 villages and that's based on GPON. Each village gets 100 meg. And we built over 70% of that network about three years ago. Then more recently, India introduced uh, a rural broadband network with OLTs in every little railway station, so about 4,800 of them. We built that as well with the 10 gigi backbone and GPON going from the railway station into the villages. Um, and uh, we started off with doing enterprises initially on carrier ethernet. So now we have one platform that does carrier ethernet enterprises. GPON to homes and XGS PON to smaller and medium enterprises. We also realized that laying fiber is a lot of work. So we have combined fixed wireless access with LTE for broadband services. And we just deployed a, a large network in Malaysia, which does fixed wireless to 30,000 rural homes. We've never seen internet before. And over time, there'll be GPON there, but so it's a combined platform. So that's what we do. Over to you, Roland. Thank you, thank you, Kumar. Uh, maybe to, to launch the, the, the discussion, uh, I will start with a, a, a question more addressed to, to, to Trevor. Um, we know that compared to uh, other uh, countries uh, uh, worldwide in terms of FTTH, UK is more at the beginning, I would say, of the uh, FTTH adventure. Japan is one technology of choice, especially uh, at BT uh, uh, OpenReach. Uh, we know that BT OpenReach uh, shows his interest for 10 g pon xgs pon uh, uh, symmetric we know also that uh, there is in the field today other technology being pushed by some vendors like uh, 25 g pon or even 50 g pon so what's today the vision uh, of uh, bt open reach uh, on this topic thanks roland so um so today open reach is deploying g pon 
um, and that's with a, a 32 way split architecture. Um, although we have run a number of trials of XGS PON, um, actually three way coexistence, and indeed we've had lab trials of 100 gig PON in, um, in the past. Um, a few points I'd like to make. I mean, as, as Rowan uh, rightly pointed out earlier, when you're when you're planning to connect millions of customers, um, you do need to pay particular attention to the high volume components, and that you know for FTTP is the ONT. And so, actually, in the Dynamics Day, it does make sense to to deploy GPON, um, offering up to one gig services, um, because and but to future proof. The head end architecture. So one of the things OpenReach has been very passionate about is making sure we have those evolution paths forward. So since we started our very first FTTP deployments um, over a decade ago, we've always had the coexistence wavelength filter so that we could add XGS PON or XGPON1 as it was at the time without interpact, impacting other people's uh, service. We've also been very strong advocates about head end architectures, um, in particular the new disaggregated architecture, so that we could build a head end which had the right switching capacity over time. So that if you do need the next pond technology, it's a case of adding a line card or adding an optic, not having to migrate all your customers from an OLT that only has a back plane big enough for GPON onto something that's then incrementally built, which has a lot of disruption as you migrate through your journey. So we are putting a lot of future proofing into, um, into those head ends um, over time. And we are active in terms of um, working in the ITU and standardization of the new PON technologies to make sure that they are ready. But we feel that where the UK is at the moment because of the, the, the balance of bandwidth such that Although people who buy 300 meg, 500 meg or one gig do burst to it, it's typically because they want to get the latest call of duty all at the same time, rather than a sustained loading on the pond. So GPON actually absorbs an awful lot of the demand, the high bandwidth demand that people want for the foreseeable future, because you don't have that concurrent instant busy hour all at incredibly high rates. And again, I think Rowan alluded to that point earlier, once the applications catch up you need to trigger a bandwidth upgrade then openreach is ready to move to the next technologies but we're not quite there yet thank you thank, thank you uh, uh trevor um a question more for for oliver uh, about those uh, ng pond technology uh, we know that swisscom uh, has tested um, last october uh, 50 uh, g pond so could you Tell us more about your conclusion on this test uh, and uh, uh, is it in the perspective to adopt 50G PON for you uh, at Swisscom? Okay, let's try to answer this question. So uh, I mentioned in the introduction that we use uh, XGS PON. Uh, mainly we use it actually for residential and small enterprise customers. And to be fully honest with, with all of you, we were pushed a bit by a competition to introduce XGS PON because one of the smaller operators in, in Switzerland introduced this technology. So we were pushed a bit to, to do it as well. But we we think that XGS PON will be enough for, for residential and small enterprise customers for quite a long time. But we also believe that it's not uh, good enough for, for business customers and also for the different X hole possibilities that are needed for, for mobile base stations, macro cells, micro cells, etc., front hole and X hole. And that's why uh, last year we also wanted to try at uh, the very early stage already to get some experience with uh, upcoming technologies. And yet we always try to, to make a, a step that is significant. So that's why we, we tried with 50 G pond, because if you are coming from 10 G, the, the step to 25 may be a bit too small. Even uh, uh, if you remember, we were coming from 1 G to 10 G. So I think it should be at least a factor of five, except if we see that uh, from a timing perspective, we would need it earlier and then uh, Maybe also this in-between technologies like 25G should be uh, regarded. But yeah, the, the main idea was really to, to get a bit of hands-on experience also with this latest and greatest technologies to, to see what you can really get. Uh, and yeah, we were 
also seen that on 50G pond, uh, we were able to deliver like 40G in, in downstream. So you, you always need to be also aware that not the, the full, let's say, physical bandwidth can be really used for services and to really offer true 10 gigabit services, except especially, let's say, for business customers that have some guarantees and so on. Uh, we believe uh, we will need something beyond 10G in, let's say, the coming few years. Thank you. Um, thank you, Oliver. Now, a question addressed uh, to, to um, Rajesh from Verizon. Uh, uh, we know that Verizon is engaged in uh, NG.2, uh, multiple web technology. technology. Uh, I remember at the time I had the chance to travel <laughs> uh, to see, uh, to listen to the um, uh, keynote speech of Glenn Welbrock, Welbrock during Fiber Connect uh, 2019. He was pointed out. Uh, uh, ng.2 to be used uh, especially for connecting at the same time uh, uh, residential enterprise and 5g base station so where are you today in this, this deployment of ng pond it is uh, uh, today uh, always the, the, the choice for for the future for, for horizon thank you Roland. uh yeah so so NG.2 and the capability to do multiple wavelength uh, channels is kind of the key component of uh, the strategy we have around kind of building out a universal access network uh, to support with the, like a residential services, which is kind of traditionally what PON has, technology has been used for, but also to be able to support some of the enterprise services like ethernet services, as well as ability to support uh, 4G backhaul as well as as we moved into 5G where we are focusing a lot on the kind of the ultra wide band millimeter wave kind of deployment uh, at, where we are trying we're using mid hall architecture uh, for that deployment uh, to be able to support the scaling which would be required for those uh, millimeter wave kind of radios which have much shorter reach compared to kind of uh, traditional uh, 4G type deployment we have done previously. The density of that is required to get closer to closer and closer to the customers and the number of radios needed is could be significantly higher. So even though we do have plans to utilize, continue to utilize some other point to point farmer for a lot of these deployment to be able to scale to the level we expect we would need to scale, we would like to introduce kind of some type of pond technology. And, and as part of that, NG Pond 2 is kind of one of the key aspects we are looking at where we are not just focusing on, say, supporting 5G, but also utilizing the same platform, same fiber, uh, our ODN, outside ODN, and everything uh, for various services. So, so as of now, we have done um, quite a bit of uh, NG Pond 2 deployment, primary. Type at this point so far, it has been focused more on uh, what we call out of franchise, which is kind of the outside our traditional uh, telco areas where we are kind of the local carrier, where we have deployed Fios for residential, but more for uh, I think we have lost uh, Rajesh. Yeah, back, sorry, somehow yeah. just got disconnected. Uh, yeah, so basically, uh, we've done significant deployment of NG.2 uh, in some of the out of franchise area, focusing on res uh, more on the business services market, uh, providing them both kind of broadband type services, but also looking at offering kind of Ethernet services. Uh, and then we are in now in the process of kind of start deploying a lot of NG technology more in the residential market uh, in our kind of traditional where we have deployed our pond services to the broadband services to the residential market and and, and it's primarily that deployment to the, towards the residential is primarily driven by desire to offer something higher than one gig right as trevor was saying the the current g point technology we have out there with millions of customers is good enough to support up to one gig service and and we don't really see the the bandwidth utilization within pond to be anywhere close to what the capacity we already have out there for gpond uh, but to, in order to be able to offer a uh, higher than one gig service which some of the msos in, in us are already doing even though it's very limited uh, deployment at this point but the expectation is that there is one plus gig services are coming very soon uh, 
so so in preparation for that we we do have plan to start uh utilizing ng pond 2 technology later this year uh, uh for offering something higher than one gig up services um so 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 that's it that's where we would start seeing some of the volumes uh being driven uh, especially from the ont side perspective right we have done significant deployment on the central office side and out of franchise where we had deployed significant number of olts but in terms of actual driving the ont volume which is where we would expect the cost to start going down hopefully as we start generating more volume and ecosystem kind of start building up uh to the price to come down so as we deploy on the residential side thank you thank you rajesh for your, for your point of view well we have the chance to have uh, uh, kumar presenting the, the vendor i would say uh, of, of this panel uh, 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 today uh, in front of all those choices uh, for telco today uh, in terms of ng pon technology uh, from 10g pon to 50g pon 25 and also ng pon 2 finally what is your point of view uh, uh, as a vendor so um, let me give you a long answer Gpon is like the 2G or 3G. You know, it's widely deployed. It does the job for homes. I think now XGS phones of the 10 gig technologies, I think XGS phone is the most interesting because you can get symmetric and why not? And that makes it attractive, if not for larger enterprises, at least for smaller enterprises and uh, even you know home, home offices and so on. So XGS phone is the next evolution we see. In fact, our approach to this is it's a, it's a combo module. So the same board does both XGS PON and GPON. So it's compatible with all the GPON that you've deployed, but you can start adding XGS PON customers on the same fiber plan. And that's the approach we have taken. And we see that XGS PON is very promising uh, for um, enterprises, small and medium enterprises, maybe, maybe small home enterprises, as well as for 5G small cell backhaul. So may not be suitable for the mid hall and front hall technologies that Rajesh talked about, but for backhaul of 5G small cells, which we see will get deployed in residential neighborhoods, I think that's a good technology. So that's the evolution we see. Beyond that, I think ng pon 2, which is multi-wavelength, you know, 10 gig is sort of an easy upgrade to just get beyond the 10 gig. Long term, uh, I agree with uh, Oliver that uh, 50 gig is the way to go, and that will be the trajectory we are on. 25 gig just seems uh, too little and 50 gig has a lot of advantages. I think ITU is defining coexistence with uh, GPON, XGS PON, and GPON 2 uh, nicely. So everything will be able to coexist. Also, if you assume a 32 way split and some loss of efficiency with 50 gig PON, you can get more than a gig to every customer. And I think that is a good target to have five, six, seven years from now when this technology is realized that everybody should have a gig uh, dedicated to their home. The last point I want to make, which may be a little bit India specific, is we have a lot of focus on protection because we see a lot of fiber cuts, a lot of digging going on for many reasons. So we also think that the, you know, with type B or type C protection based on what the user can afford, it is time for GPON to also get resilient against uh, fiber cuts. So over to you, that's what I have. Thank you, thank you, Kumar, for for your point of view. Uh, I would like to to, to come back um, on, on, for me on, on one of the driver for adopting NGPON. I mean the really convergence of, of the fixed and mobile network, especially with the arrival of, of 5G. Uh, uh, until now, in the telecom industry, we have seen a lot of separation. I would say uh, with the fixed network and the mobile backhaul network. Uh, do you think that uh, with the arrival of 5G and especially uh, with the millimeter waves, when we should see uh, um, growth of, of base station, uh, I, I would say, uh, do you see really this as a major driver uh, for telcos for adopting uh, ng pond te te technology and, and sharing a fixed and mobile backhaul and front all uh, uh, network? Uh, could you comment on this, starting by, by Oliver, maybe? Yeah, so we definitely see a, a trend towards this. To to be honest, uh, we are not there yet. So at the moment, it's still a bit, let's say, separated. And uh, all our mobile stations 
are, let's say, on their dedicated network, but also, let's say, from operational efficiency reasons, uh, we would like to to get onto a common platform, but it will take a bit of time. And I think it was also mentioned this morning by, by Orange, for example. Uh, I guess it may be still the case that the, the mobile and the, the residential customers are on different pond trees, but at least that uh, they should work on, on the same kind of platform. That's uh, kind of our vision to, to go there. But as mentioned a bit, uh, so we will do that step with the introduction of the next technology uh, evolution step, uh, which is still uh, some years out, but uh, I believe it strongly that we will go there. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Oliver. Uh, Trevor, what's your point of view on this? So uh, I think it's fair to say it's a, a subject of great debate, even in, in internally. Um, I mean, the UK, in terms of its role at the moment is is for 5G is, is macro led. So that's all on point to point n times 10 gig. Um, and it's in different locations, the residential rollout. Um, when it comes to planning for uh, the future, it's what well, I often just come from the perspective of it should, you know, it starting with a, a common ODN. So rather than having two networks, one for point to point and, and one for residential, how do you how do you design your fiber networks in, in cognizant of all the demand so that if you can take sufficient fiber into your access network when planning your various spine and optical components, you can have the potential of deploying point to point or PON because uh, Ultimately, if the glass is available, that's a far simpler implementation than trying to get mobile with its different combinations working over PON, especially a time uh, a time um, div um, division multiplex the technology or the TDD, sorry, um, technology such as PON, which introduces the complexity of having to engineer around uh, jitter and delay, which you wouldn't necessarily want for some of the mobile architectures. So we start with... Uh, you know, common planning for how do you get the most amount of glass in, which of course is an option when you're building, but is less available to those who are who have already built their networks and are have then having to overlay. Um, and then I think it highly depends on on the whether PON will be suitable for the different mobile architectural choices of front hall, mid hall, and back hall for the different operators uh, that will come. And I don't think we've got a clear resolution. Uh, to that yet. Um, in particular, we've got uh, uh, some people in the, mob in the UK mobile operators who are saying even small cells would need dedicated 10 gig symmetric plus connections, which you wouldn't try to deliver using a pond. You'd deliver because um, you just wouldn't get the gain. But uh, I think uh, time will tell, unfortunately. Thank you. Um, thank you, Trevor. Uh, Rajesh, uh, on this convergence of fixed and 5G, will Verizon finally has an advantage with the choice of NG.2 and multiple wavelength? Or what's the status for you? Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, so we, we, we kind of taking a multifaceted approach to that, this uh, issue of wireless and wireless uh, convergence. So as Trevor mentioned, so definitely the first layer is uh, the fiber itself, right? So we, we have this initiative called One Fiber, where we're basically putting a lot of fiber out there to able to support all various um, use cases we have for uh, outside plan, right? 4G, 5G deployment, as well as business and uh, and some cases residential uh, services. Uh, so kind of a lot of our front uh, deployment for definitely existing 4G deployment, as well as uh, some of the sub six gigahertz deployment for 5G, which is utilizing the front hall architecture. So we do see that continue to kind of use the, the point to point fiber as part of that one fiber deployment we have done. Uh, but the, when we look at kind of the, the back hall scenario, uh, as well as uh, the mid hall architecture, as I mentioned earlier, for the 5G we are using, where we are integrating the the distributed unit function of the BBU, traditional BBU function into the radio itself, and then able to utilize the mid-hall interface from that radio back into the central office uh, location. Uh, that basically becomes at that point, uh, primarily they're carrying the, the customer traffic back. Uh, so that in that sense, it becomes a capacity planning uh, issue 
similar to kind of the broadband services we do on uh, on on pawn technology today is to manage the capacity for that radio based on number of subscribers we might expect and a kind of the peak uh, traffic they may generate. And so it becomes a very similar problem as we already have with respect to the broadband services. So there we do see very need to kind of a very good opportunity for technology like ng point to be utilized for that uh, deployment. And our, we are doing significant deployment in use, utilizing the millimeter wave. Uh, which utilizes that uh, mid hall architecture. So we do see uh, scaling of that uh, deployment to be able to utilize a technology like NG.2. And, and then that, that having that multiple wavelength capability with NG.2 give us that flexibility of dedicating a wavelength uh, channel, for, channel for 5G application where we have certain number of radios being aggregated on that channel. And down the road, when we do see need for additional capacity, we can add additional channel uh, for the say for, for 5G and able to split out number of radios across those multiple channels. So basically doubling the bandwidth. So that gives us a long uh, few way to kind of keep uh, incrementally adding more bandwidth as we need uh, for 5G application, but also at the same time, utilize the other wavelength for residential or and or kind of business services. So that gives us a lot of flexibility. So this is kind of the overall plan for kind of building out a universal access network. So that plays nicely into that uh, to bring in the kind of the wireless component as part of that same universal access network. Uh, and then if, if we extend that uh, kind of the convergence model back more into the kind of the the network side of it, once you hit the central office or location where you're bringing your fiber in, uh, we, we have a, uh, we are building out last couple of years a brand new network. We call it IEN or Intelligent Edge Network. So that's a converged network which is being utilized across wireline and wireless services. So even if you are using point-to-point -point fiber for a front hall architecture, once it reaches the central office, uh, from that point on, we have a common uh, transport network across wireline wireless. So used for fires, broadband services, used for business services, and also same network is utilized for the for, for the wireless wireless network to get to the any SAP location or wherever the the other end of the BBU uh, happens to be. <clears throat> so on the network side, we already have done that convergence and with this uh, new brand new network we've been building out. And then I think the next flavor of that convergence also comes into this some of the work happening around uh, BBU and 3GPP around kind of the converging the the control plane itself uh, across wireline wireless services, right? So bringing in uh, some of the wireline aspects, broadband aspects into the, the 5G core control plane. Uh, so, so that's something more, more a recent activity we have started looking at, evaluating how that may fit into kind of bringing in wireline and wireless uh, into the same control plane architecture. Uh, from technical perspective, it makes a lot of sense that given that if you're offering you, utilizing 5G and offering broadband services from customer perspective, it's no different than offering the same broadband services using fiber, right? So it's, we are selling fire services uh, over fiber, but we are also selling 5G home services over 5G network. From customer perspective, it's the same service. So having a common control plane, data plane uh, uh, would make a lot of sense. So that's something we are still evaluating how that will evolve uh, from the convergence perspective. Back to you, thank you, thank you, uh, Rajesh, for those explanations. Um, to your point of view, uh, Kumar, uh, as a vendor, what would you recommend to, to for this convergence of, of, of fixed and mobile with the role of 5G in particular? So, I think 5G has you know many faces. So, if you look at 5G macro and a lot of spectrum, then it will require you know a lot of bandwidth, front hall is difficult to do on pawn technologies today. Maybe, you know, 50 pawn will solve it, but front hall requires a lot of bandwidth. But, and millimeter wave also has a lot of spectrum. So that might also, you know, require more bandwidth. But if you take a focused approach and say 5G small cells in FR1 for a mid hall or back hall architecture, like Rajesh described, the EU is integrated with the RU then that bandwidth is very much in the realm of what you can do with even XGS pawn, even without NG pawn too. And so if you have a converged uh, you know, G pawn, I mean, a pawn network, which is serving homes and enterprises with XGS pawn, 
it is very feasible on that same network to do 5G small cell backhaul, especially in FR1. Okay? It also depends on how much spectrum you have. So in FR1, for example, in India, we don't expect operators to have more than 40 megahertz because there's not a lot of spectrum in the 3.5, you know, 200 megahertz across four or five operators. So I think that is something we're seeing interest from our customers who are deploying essentially both fiber back, fiber based broadband to the homes with GPON in the past, with XGS PON today, who also will address the same market with 5G because that's the same market. As Rajesh said, it doesn't matter to the customer, he just wants broadband. So that going after that same market with 5G, it is a little bit easier because you don't have to do that last 100 meters of fiber rollout. And they want to use the same font. So if you can get fiber to the home, well and good. If not, you at least want to do 5G backhaul with the same um, XGS pawn network. And there is concrete interest. They're checking out uh, things like timing, for example. They want to be able to run and uh, be able to provide timing to the 5G small cell using the pawn network. So I think we will see a converge uh, 5G small cell backhaul and XGS pawn uh, very soon. That's thank all you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Kumar. Um, another point may be um, we know that uh, today the telecom industry, like other uh, industries, asked to be uh, sustainable and to take care about uh, power consumption. Uh, most of the time, we are saying that uh, FTTH uh, network as a better uh, carbon uh, uh, emission exp uh, experience compared to, to copper, for, for, for example. Um, what's your point of view with the arrival of uh, NG Pond to from 10G uh, to, to, to 50? Uh, um, there is uh, already uh, an impact on, on power consumption. Uh, what, what is the telco point of view uh, on, on, on this for your choice? Uh, starting by, by Oliver, please. Yeah, so <clears throat> for Swisscom, really, the, the, the let's say the, the green aspects are also very important. And in earlier years, I was also very much involved, for example, in the European Code of Conduct for broadband equipment. I think there was a lot of progress, and especially with, uh, with these pond technologies, where the, let's say the CO side equipment is very good utilized by also having the, the splitting ratio of, let's say, 1 to 32 or even 1 to 64. The, let's say the cost per bit is, is actually going down dramatically. I think where we need to, uh, to, to pay careful attention is on the, on the customer premises equipment because uh, the, my dream is that they would scale as much as possible with the real traffic they need. And if they idle, they should use at least uh, the least amount of energy that is, is possible. Uh, we also, let's say that this is probably not a very good example, but because it was a very early technology trial. But when we did this 50G, the, the ONT side was, was, was huge. And uh, apart from using a lot of energy, it also made a huge amount of noise. So really there, I think uh, from a holistic point of view, the, I think the customer premises equipment is getting more and more important for the overall carbon footprint. Thank you, um, Oliver. Uh, Trevor, any comment on this sustainable uh, aspect? Um, absolutely, and I think it, it's great to be talking about it now. Um, I think it's it, it's very easy if, to, if you take a short term view. As you see, we're coming from a world with with PSDN switches and VDSL or um, access technologies, and saying the OLTs are far more efficient, and they are. You know, it, it's a much better technology. But um, we're also at that inflection point where we have to choose as we create the future technologies, do we incorporate the sort of dynamic behavior and complexity that's there to save power in the longer term? Because, you know, we are that the, the, the as 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 with, um, I guess, the point that was made earlier about FTTP and high speed services exposing energy consumption elsewhere in the va in the chain in terms of bandwidth um, for operators provisioning gigabit services and beyond through their OLTs, through their switches, and then into their end-to-end -end networks drives a huge amount of capacity that has to be provisioned. And we can't really afford to be in 10 years time where we're burning 
amount of power that corresponds to a two hour peak utilization in the network at all the time, because all we're going to do is effectively end up back on that escalator of, although the joules per bit shifted will be constantly falling, our absolute power consumption will start marching back upwards because we're having to provision bigger and bigger end-to-end -end networks. So what we're really studying now and looking at is actually what are, how do we take the learning from things like the ONT low power modes, the snoozy modes, the sleepy modes, how do you think about incorporating traffic dependent scaling in your OLTs and then on through your disaggregated switches to say, how do we always run the network at the right size and therefore minimize the energy consumption rather than scaling for the once every six to 12 month peak and that's a corresponding energy consumption. So no answers, but I absolutely believe it's the right question for operators, vendors and um, and component manufacturers to be studying now so we get it right for high speed PON and beyond. Thank you. Thank you, Trevor. Uh, Rajesh, your point of view on this, on sustainability? Yeah, so, so uh, yeah, I, I think reduction of power is always kind of one of the key aspects that we kind of look at as part of the network uh, our design we do. Uh, and Trevor mentioned some of the key things which are part of the kind of the pawn technology out there kind of to support some of the reduction on the ONT side with the low power mode and when things are not being used to able to shut down, take a power down some of the components with or on a, run them on a reduced uh, power. And that, that's one of the First thing we are kind of focusing on right now as part of kind of our next gen pond deployment is to making sure we have all the tools available and all the capabilities supported as part of the, our ONT and, ONU, uh, ONT and OLT uh, design that we, we are able to actually take advantage of that and able to kind of achieve those power savings, especially on the ONU side, uh, uh, on, the, on the customer home to reduce the power consumption when they, the things are not being used, utilized, which probably are the case most of the time. Uh, and so so that's the, the first step kind of we are focusing on to making sure we have the, we can utilize all the capabilities which are already available. Uh, and then uh, I think that definitely on the CO side, as Trevor kind of mentioned, they are kind of, more challenges in terms of our reduction there side. So, so one of the use case actually as kind of the of the multi wavelength technology like ng point two, we see that as we start deploying more and more channels in the network to support various type of services uh, that present us a uh, opportunity, and that's something we are building into our design. Is where during say off period we are able to kind of move all all those different type of customers onto say a single channel and shut down the, the cha other channels when, when we don't really need. So that they still have the services, but we may not, instead of 30 gig capacity on that pond, we may be down to 10 gigs during the night times, but we are able to shut down the other two, three lasers, uh, which may be active during uh, other times. So that, that should provide us significant uh, power savings on, on the kind of the network side of components. So that's, that's kind of the next step we see uh, as we start deploying our pond technology, next gen pond technology in the network. Thank you. Thank, thank you, uh, Rajesh. Um, Kumar, what's your point of view as a vendor on sustainability and Japan? If you step back and we take a point of view that one gigabit per home is required, then what are your alternatives, right? So wireless is the worst from a sustainability point of view because the power, power consumption on doing 5G, you know, high power, high capacity radios is the worst because of all the RF power amplifier efficiencies. So that's the worst. Then if you come to wireless, so wireline is a hands down winner. Within wireline, I think passive technology which is on based is far better than any kind of active switched or routed technology. So I think, you know, pawn technology has been hands down. We can optimize further as Rajesh, Rajesh mentioned, but for broadband to the home, pawn is clearly the sustainable uh, winner. It is the electric car of broadband. Thank That's you. Fine. Thank you. Thank you, Kumar. I don't know if there is questions uh, coming uh, from the attendants at the moment. I don't see any on the, on the chat box. 
please don't hesitate to ask uh, your questions if you if you want on the chat box. Um, so maybe another uh, another question or a new a new word of, of fixed access. What are today the main technology challenges you are you are facing? The, the more painful, uh, I, I would say. And uh, what do you need from vendor to to help? We are talking about uh, several aspects, but uh, what are the main um, uh, the main challenges you are, you are facing uh, uh, at the moment? Uh, maybe starting with you, uh, Oliver. Yes, so you know, I would say there are in, let's say, two, two kind of dimensions. So one dimension is that we are, we are coming from point to point, and let's say with this point to multi-point, we still need to uh, learn a bit and get experience. Uh, what are the difficult fault patterns? How do we locate faults, etc.? And how do we quickly uh, resolve faults? So I think in terms of fulfillment, etc. This is uh, like fully automated uh, in, in our network, so that runs very smoothly. But if it goes to, to automation of the assurance processes, I think there, there's still potential. And for example, one kind of pretty specific point or difficulty that we have in Switzerland is, is maybe also coming from the fact that we are moving from point to point to XGS pond. So it also happens that we have point to point uh, ONTs on our XGS pond network, which kind of act as a rogue ONT and can also disturb the, the other customers on the same pond tree. So that's one of uh, the very specific, uh, let's say, challenges we, we are working on at the moment. So we did already quite some improvement in terms of determining what is the, the impact and also try to automate as much as possible the, the, the localization of such a rogue ONT, but uh, it's uh, still some, some work to do. And then uh, another angle is more towards the, let's say, the automation of the whole network, uh, going into the direction of CI CDs uh, stuff that we are becoming more agile, etc. work in the direction of software defined networks which also needs quite a transformation of, of the whole company, of the workforce, of the way we work. And I would say there we are still, let's say, in the first third of our path to, towards the future. This is still some journey, and uh, but I believe this will also bring uh, benefits uh, to the overall society and also uh, making us more efficient, but also for the customers that we can uh, enable new features much earlier and can solve problems uh, in, in a shorter time. That's a kind of the vision that we would like to, to achieve. Thank and actually you. for all of that problems, uh, we need a, a solid uh, ecosystems uh, where our vendor as partners work together with us, especially if we are going in the direction of this CICD. So this uh, needs both partners working closely together to, to reach the goals. Uh, that's my my view at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Oliver. Uh, Trevor, what, what are the main uh, technology challenges you are facing today? Well, to, I guess uh, slightly off topic, but I guess the, 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 well, the, the biggest challenge we have with the role of FTTP isn't to do with the electronics, it's to do with the civil engineering. So part of the work we're actually looking is how do you use other tools like that, even as speculatively as, you know, you know, use of new tools and things like robotics and things to solve that. But bringing it into the sphere that we're talking about, um, I think it's it's probably still going to be it's going to be around interoperability. I think that's still one of the the, the big issues that everyone, every operator and uh, vendors do struggle with, and that's technical and that's also you know um, the way that freight you know um, things are configured. Um, and I think that the other one that I think will, as, as the networks mature and we go through and um, Kumar referred to it, you know, how, how do we have the right level of test and diagnostics and instrumentation of our ODNs so that when we do get fiber cuts, we can do localization and test and diagnostics to the level of accuracy that we all want. And how do we build the right enablers into our networks to be able to do that? Because I think as as everyone has resonated through the conference so far, people are becoming more and more dependent on these connections. You know, the, the, the time from a fiber issue to a uh, a call into a call center is actually in hours rather than days now compared to where it was before. 
And so we need to be able to get those technicians to the right place to fix it as soon as possible. So I think fault localization, test and diagnostics and telemetry are going to be a really key um, subject moving forward as well. Thank you. Thank you, Trevor. Uh, what, Rajesh, what's otherwise on the, the main uh, uh, technology challenges you are facing? Yeah, so I think uh, there are a couple of things we are working on as part of our kind of our next gen pond deployment. Uh, one, one is related to uh, the using ng pond two for kind of the five G use cases we were discussing earlier. Uh, so from practical, so there's a kind of technical part of it, but from practical perspective. Uh, When we actually go to deploy, people don't want to necessarily, from operational perspective, don't want to necessarily have to install another component next to the radio, right? You don't want that ONT having to be powered and installed in addition to the 5G radio. So because today, they, when we are using point-to-point -point fiber, they are used to plugging in 10 gig ethernet optics in it uh, with the fiber, and then they just walk away. So there's only one component they have to worry about. So even though we are we are all doing some field trials with ngpon 2 for 5G uh, mid-all kind of architecture, from practical perspective, we actually plan to uh, utilize a pluggable uh, SFP plus ONU uh, for, for this use case, right? So, so that way from, uh, from installation perspective, it's no different than what they do today. Basically, instead of a 10 gig Ethernet optics, they're just plugging in a, which happens to be NG.2 ONU. Uh, but other beyond that, basically, it works exactly the same way from field perspective, right? So that's something we've been working with our optics vendor uh, for last year plus now. Uh, and so there are definitely a couple of challenges we had to overcome uh, to get to the kind of the a solution uh, which can be deployed uh, and mostly around heat dissipation and power consumption because the SFP plus, of course, <laughs> from the spec perspective is designed only a one and a half watts and maybe up to two watts in some cases. But uh, but here we are looking at probably a little over three watts, uh, three to four watts con consumption. So that's definitely one of the key challenges uh, we are working with vendors to solve, to bring that to reasonably at least under three watts, because we can work with our radio vendors to make sure those SFP plus cages are designed to at least able to support three watt power draw, uh, which most of the vendor anyway do, right? Even though spec calls for one and a half, two watts for SFP plus, most of the vendors do design their cages to support up to two and a half to three watts uh, power. So that's something, one of the key aspects uh, we are working with. Uh, there is also physical, uh, packaging comes into play. Definitely, SFP Plus is a pretty small form factor. Uh, so, packaging all the optics as well as SOC components into that is a is key component. So that even though we do have a solution which fits into that, but it does result in some kind of hammerhead in beyond in that SFP. So even though it fits into the regular cage, but it is a little bigger in the back. <laughs> so making sure that physically also it fits into the whole all kind of the enclosures within the 5G radio is another piece we are working around. But that's probably somewhat easier to solve, but the power consumption and heat dissipation is probably the bigger issue we are still working uh, with our vendors um, on. So I think that's definitely one of the key for able to utilize this technology for NG, for the 5G deployment. And more general, as we deploy this technology for residential services, definitely cost is a key component, uh, becomes a more important component of, uh, of the overall picture of the optics, especially for NG.2 having durable optics. Uh, so working towards a lower cost solution there is another aspect we are working with. We need to get uh, towards kind of some more like a peak based architecture in the optic sides to help with the uh, kind of the easier assembly process as well as kind of the higher yield, hopefully uh, to lower the overall cost. Definitely volume drives most of the cost, <laughs> but having some of these components in place kind of helps longer term sustain those prices. So, so that's a couple of other challenges we are working with our vendors. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Rajesh, for, for, for this comment. Uh, Kumar, any reaction uh, uh, as a vendor to, to, the, to the comment uh, we have just heard from our three distinguished uh, panelists? 
Yeah, let me tell you what we hear from other customers is that what they need from vendors beyond, you know, supplying OLTs and ONTs. One is they want interoperability between ONTs, the existing OLTs and vice versa. They see this as an issue because they don't want to continue sometimes with their existing vendor or they want alternative, you know, given the geopolitical situation, that's not surprising. So we see a lot of requests for, can you interoperate with your OLTs with all my existing OLTs or vice versa? And we do a lot of that. And the goal is really to be like a mobile phone. You know, your, your mobile phone works at any, any base station. So that's the goal. But there's a little twist to this because a lot of the times the operators also want to be able to manage this. So they want TR69 or some form of management. They want to put a thin management layer also. So that is one of the other issues, but they want perfect interoperability. This is the number one issue they, they ask. Second is they're looking at reducing the cost of the OLT. So there is interest in white box. You know, Can you just do a software? Can we get white box? They see what has happened in the data center uh, you know, switches. So that is the second uh, technology challenge from a cost reduction. The third one in that order is, you know, virtualization. So they want, once they do the disaggregation of hardware and software on the OLT, they want to say, okay, can we virtualize this and run except for Fi and Mac, everything in, in some cloud. That's the least developed uh, uh, of the three questions. But this is what we see our customers asking us in terms of partnerships. Over to you, Roland. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Maybe um, one last uh, question for me coming from the uh, uh, attendance. Uh, maybe for you, Oliver, as the question is, uh, there is some success for point to point fiber network in some countries. Do you foresee 10 gigabit Ethernet as a cost effective solution as you have expertise on this uh, Ethernet point to point at Swisscom or maybe you could comment on this? Yeah, so as you can imagine, because we are coming from point to point, we had a, a lot of debate uh, to this. Uh, we saw that the, let's say the industry trend is really going into to PON. And uh, I think the, the nice thing about PON is the, you need like the, the headline speed for marketing reasons. But what we heard also during this panel that the, the real need for the customers is to sustainably uh, draw traffic is much lower. And there, if you have a technology that kind of works in a shared medium approach has some benefits. So you can still offer the, the a very high peak rate, but also share the, the cost of the, let's say the optical transmitter on the, on the CO side. So, uh, in my opinion, uh, the point-to-point -point going to even higher uh, bit rates is feasible, but uh, I think it will be more expensive. But probably Kumar, from a vendor perspective, can tell more about it. Please, Kumar. Thank you, Oliver. I think the point-to-point -point in, in the markets I see is mostly for the radio, right? You know, the radios are point-to-point -point for front hall, CIPRI interfaces today. For that to move to any kind of pawn, whether it's HGS pawn or NG pawn too, I think requires a number of problems to be solved um, related to timing, latency on the uplink, and so on. I think some of these are work in progress, but I think we are not there definitely for front haul. We can get there for back haul soon, and I think that can move to XGS pawn, but front haul will require more work on the technology front to, you know, to minimize latency, especially due to the multiple access and so on. So I, I don't see the radio front hall and all that moving to pawn immediately. Perfect. So uh, I think uh, we have raised uh, time for closing uh, this, uh, this session. Uh, uh, I would like to thank you all, uh, Kumar, Oliver, Trevor, uh, and Rajesh, uh, for your insights, and I hope that the attendants enjoyed enjoyed our our discussion around the, the, the subject. I wish you all a, a, a nice continuation for the, for the conference, and I hope that for next year we will see uh, each other live. Uh, I, I would say, and shaking hands. Thank you to all, and uh, enjoy your day. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone.